I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. Today is the third video in a series on the wondrous wisdom, which is the language of wisdom, the language of cognitive frameworks uh, that uh, we're relating uh, with uh, advanced mathematics. Uh, and that's what Math for Wisdom is all about. And in this uh, episode, we're going to talk about the relationship between God, good, life, and eternal life. And this is the sum of uh, all of my philosophy, you know, all of my wisdom. Life is the fact that God is good, but eternal life is understanding that God doesn't have to be good. Or simply just the saying, God doesn't have to be good. Uh, understanding what that means. And so every wise man um, used to have just one saying, uh, you know, like avoid extremes or know thyself. So there were seven Greek sages uh, and each of them had a sentence like that. I think that was enough to have one sentence. So that would be my aphorism, would be uh, God doesn't have to be good. And so I'll be talking, what do I mean by that? But I mean that that is the source and essence of all wisdom. It comes down to that. So let's look at where this fits. Uh, I'm giving an overview of wondrous wisdom. And uh, then I'll be able to give regular uh, talks about uh, the research I'm doing, you know, which will be fun to uh, say how this keeps expanding. Maybe that could be research we do together. I gave a first video on the building blocks, the there this bottom up um, documentation of the frameworks of perspectives that describe the limits of imagination. So what does it mean to well, think of something like free will versus fate as a division of everything into two perspectives. And so technically that would be uh, opposites coexist or all things are the same, let's say. And so um, after those preliminaries, I gave a video about the top-down point of view. You know, when I step back and look at all this evidence I've collected and also the evidence from my own life, uh, which includes, you know, a relationship with God, sometimes cold, you know, sometimes warm uh, from living on the edge. So I gave an overview of the definitions of God and human that came up uh, with regard to the big picture, the top down view. What is this all about? And uh, I didn't quite finish with that. Um, there will be this video, at least one more. Uh, this video will be about the heart of the matter, which is um, um, God doesn't have to be good. So, and then um, there'll be probably one about the meaning of life, uh, and there'll be maybe one more, I don't know. But then there'll be about um, the big picture. What are the questions that's God investigating? And uh, what are the questions that humans investigate? And that'll be a little bit relevant to what we do today, because basically... God is asking, is God necessary? Like, would there be God if God was not, right? So this idea of creating conditions where there is no God and then seeing how God emerges, you know, and then that showing that, you know, whether or not God is, but you're going to end up with God. So God is necessary. That's the kind of uh, investigation that seems to be uh, underway, you know, when I study the limits of my imagination uh, and, uh, you know, the evidence for other people's uh, imagination. Now, for humans, uh, we're in the opposite situation. We're in conditions. And so how do we transcend those conditions? And that involves this kind of like uh, appreciating, embracing a godly point of view. So we have different investigations. And also that will come up today. And so then um, each of those investigations, uh, it's very practical. And we'll actually come up with some of these eightfold frameworks today. But so when humans transcend themselves uh, the limits of the imagination are maybe like six perspectives but you can have within that above and beyond what we're able to think of as the system that we're in there could be an extra perspective like the slack the looseness the goodness um, 
within, but there can also be something just completely beyond. So God can just be completely beyond this system. Okay, that's why he doesn't have to be good. Now, uh, in terms of God's um, point of view, there are these huge uh, 24-fold sciences. Uh, and I'll also give you a little glimpse of that. Uh, uh, so how does it mean to just know everything? What does it look like when you unfold it? Uh, so that'll be, um, hopefully, with within a couple of months, uh, we'll be able to have a series of videos like that to catch people up to speed to what I'm about. I can refer back to them. And then I'll be able to talk about my research uh, a little bit on hold, on pause right now. But uh, I am uh, thinking about this question, how to relate wisdom and everything. And so wisdom um, involves those eightfold human frameworks. Uh, and there's a science of everything, that there's a 24-fold science uh, that, uh, from a God's point of view. And that would be about what does it mean to be a first person? I, how do I relate to all of the meaningful experiences in my life? So that's the kind of data I look at. Uh, I collect um, and I try to model. And so based on that connection, I would like to clarify, well, what's going on with this science of everything that I hypothesize? So we'll see. So let's start with this, uh, I call it the equation of life, um, in the sense that uh, it's a way of defining life uh, as, as equating, you know, conditionally, let's say God and good. But it's not just an equation. There's furthermore an understanding. And understanding means to separate, to be able to separate and tease out and see, you know, what is what. And that uh, teasing out is more than life. It's uh, eternal life, eternal growth, uh, eternal learning. So uh, God, I won't uh, define uh, much. Uh, there's the previous video for you to uh, think about. But... Um, Let's just say that God is beyond conditions. And as God demonstrates, you know, his unconditionality, well, he should also be within conditions, possibly, right? It shouldn't matter. So how does God establish such conditions? So then, you know, God has to remove away from unconditionality and create space for conditionality. And so uh, God would presumably reappear in this uh, within conditions. And so that would be the goodness. Okay, so God is beyond conditions. Good is God within conditions. Life is the fact that God is good. So that uh, where these meet up, right? And so when you see something alive, you see, oh, wow, there's some kind of looseness. There's some kind of flow. There's some kind of, a, you know, ability for even in these conditions, for some kind of spirit to move around, to uh, to uh, have this freedom, right? And so, uh, but life means that there's some kind of holistic environment that is uh, favoring that, supporting that, you know, not just... <laughs> some Somehow they're in sync, this holistic support and this uh, dynamic freeness, uh, and somehow they're able to be in synergy, in symbiosis, you know, be cooperative. Uh, and that's life. Okay, so it's quite a vague definition, but it's getting to the heart of it. We, uh, of course, actually experience that um, subjectively. And so when we talk about experience, uh, that's what we are experiencing. You know, we're experiencing that relationship. Uh, and also, like, so we do have a holistic kind of self which actually has some, actually some transcendent uh, significance, you know, but it's, we have some kind of unity and then we also have some kind of uh, looseness and slack to our experience. So eternal life is saying, uh, reminding or maybe emphasizing that, uh, hey, God does not have to be good. You know, God is more than uh, conditional. God is beyond conditions. So just Understanding that, appreciating that kind of says, hey, you know, insisting that God is good is um, not really uh, being uh, humble before God, you know. God is good. That's God's business, you know, and God doesn't have to be good. I think that's the thing. That's the, that's the, maybe the, 
proper attitude? Uh, is it correct? Well, let's look at our testimony. But in order to have testimony, right, which is very important, we have to have um, a free and open mind. Uh, we have to be able to be not prejudiced. You know, what does our testimony mean if we're just completely prejudiced, right? And so there's Psalms uh, by uh, the King David. Um, I think he was, you know, in battles and whatever says, hey, like, save me, because otherwise you're going to look bad. <laughs> like, so uh, this idea that, uh, you know, the battle has not over, you know, things are still being uh, debated, right? And so uh, it's early to praise God, you know, we're still waiting for the victory, right? I mean, I'm, I'm all for worshiping God, uh, and I think that that worship doesn't necessarily have to it can certainly be uh, insistent. And, you know, and and I think that there's something about God within conditions, goodness, or something like, you know, the spirit of Jesus that insists that God be good, you know, because that's just got to be the case. But understanding in eternal life is appreciating that that's just not the true. And so you have these, uh, and this will be maybe for future videos, these father-son conflicts uh, between Jesus and uh, God where, you know, on the one hand, it says, uh, God, you know, loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son, right? But at the Last Supper, Jesus prays, you know, I don't pray for the world, you know, I pray for my own. So that distinction between um, Jesus' inclinations, like this, the Sermon on the Mount saying, hey, like, why don't all the good kids come together and let's do these things that I'm teaching? And, uh, and if, you know, everyone will be converted by my example and uh, our example and then the kingdom of heaven will be established on earth you know god will be with us on earth but that wasn't to be you know and so in uh, gets in um, the mount of olives you know uh jesus had to say like this is not my will but it's not about my will it's about your will you know take this cup away from me that's my will not because jesus favored the good son i think but uh, god you know said no we got to favor the bad son the bad kid okay jesus favored the good kid hey we could be good kids like in the prodigal son right i emphasize with the good brother right not the prodigal son but it's not what the story is about right why did jesus talk about that i think that's the point is that he went to say i can empathize with you but can you empathize with me Okay, so that was a tangent. But um, just to say that this claim, um, it's extremely radical, extremely uh, provocative, um, that, uh, you know, God does not have to be good. Uh, and so, uh, first of all, like, it's important for me, like, uh, that was a very long process, about 20 years. Uh, so I came to this kind of conclusion around the year 2000. Uh, and uh, it was very helpful, uh, first of all, uh, the Bible, you know, the Gospels, especially the Gospel of John uh, seems to be a gospel where Jesus is talking to his best friend, the way that he sees things, the way that he talks about things. It's very algebraic. It's very, it's, and so that should be a future video. I, I did an investigation around that time, about 20 years ago to uh, say, like, what is he talking about? How does this algebra come together? What is about, you know, because it's about his father's will, you know, and things like that. What is that father's will? But I think that the father's will was basically eternal life. And then what is this eternal life? And so, again, God does not have to be good, you know, is the basis for learning. So one is uh, the Gospel of John uh, was my source for that. Another is um, just caring to be a loving person who reaches out to people on the margins and, you know, siding with them and just realizing, man, like once you side with people who are, you know, people who are uh, in trouble or, you know, you know, of a discriminated against, um, trying to uh, do the right thing, uh, not going along with everyone else so easily, right? Uh, you side with them, you yourself will get, uh, you will get, uh, you have the privilege of seeing like them destroyed, even if you're not. I saw my friend, Brother David Ellison Bay, who you saw, if you saw the video introduction to Math for Wisdom, you know, he had this wonderful house. You see, like, it's 
full of books. His house was his mind, right? And his house was taken away from him. And it's a long story, but basically there was absolutely no reason to do that, you know. And the fact that he was a Moorish American, the fact that he lived in a neighborhood, no one ever came out to visit him. No one ever came out to understand what was going on. He was an elderly man. And just to see, like, that house, which was worth $60,000, uh, he got uh, he got thrown out of it. Uh, the word is, uh, I forget. But anyways, uh, he and in the end, they threw out all of his books, all of his treasures. They couldn't find a buyer, of course. And so the house was just destroyed and the lot was sold, I think, like for $5,000. It's just completely backwards. This was during the economic crisis of 2008, 2009. It's a horrible story. So I lived with him for a year or two or so, and I had the privilege of seeing that, you know, that's a horrible privilege right? to see like the reality of life. Is that good of God, like to show me that? You know, thanks, you know, like thanks. And to make all, you know, these efforts to do things, to get people to care and just to see it's completely hopeless. And, you know, just to talk to him because, you know, little, you know, there's elements of dysfunction and just to realize it's just uh, try and try, but it's not going to, you know, it's just painful to watch. And it's very hurtful to see him hurt. You know, he's a lovely person. So many uh, episodes like that, that's just one, you know, we hear about them in the news all the time, but I think it's different. Like you actually get to be a part of it and get to see it. Uh, you see that uh, saying that like God is good, I think is just really not being uh party to the main things in life and it's really kind of disgusting thing to say it's kind of uh it's uh really uh making god irrelevant and not a party to this and uh, just showing that uh whoever says this is not really participating in life in any christly or humanly way it's gross you know and when you think about it so with respect to god saying that's not a thing to say lightly but if we're going to make testimony, that is my testimony, right? And so to build on that, to understand that. Another thing from a uh, maybe logical point of view, metaphysical point of view, or just, you know, just how things are set up is that, okay, so why uh, why it's the importance of God not having to be good? Well, first of all, I mean, just from a practical point of view, we're supposed to be good. It's not about God. You know, like we're in this system. We should be godly. Uh, in this system, godliness is goodness, Right. But uh, we don't have to be in this system. We can go beyond this system. So first of all, to see, to appreciate that difference, that the God within me and the God beyond me, you know, are the same God, but the God within me defers to the God beyond me. That's the proper relationship as it was on the Mount of Olives, right? So, and we're somewhere in between, right? So, um, of course, you know, if we can identify with the God within, um, beautiful, um, but um, even if we can't, uh, we're still in between, we're still part of that relationship and the fact that um that's actually kind of like holding that we're in between like we're in that gap that uh we are maybe because of whatever we're going through like we're blocking that relationship between the god within and god beyond you know in a certain sense like you know we're we're a part of that uh, how they fit together so you know and because uh, again like uh not to presume God uh, in the sense that it's in God's interest and in the interest of his investigation to see like, hey, does God really appear? Does God really? So this idea that there's a bit of a disconnect, you know, that's keeping the God from beyond, you know, to equating with the God within, that means there's an investigation going on, right? So that seems a good thing to be modeling, you know, what's going on. That's an exciting thing to be modeling. But in as much as this relates to our growth, you know, how can we fit into this uh, picture uh, the way we might best in, you know, and, and again, for our own reasons, you know, like what's going on, because, you know, we end up in this space that's created uh, where, you know, we're kind of wandered in and, and you know, evolved in. And, and so we're here we are. Um, but um, about this um growth process so like you know we're designed to be growing as children but um there's sometimes this taboo uh, maybe it's changing you know that adults don't need to grow adults don't grow adults are grown right so this idea no 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 like it, it's about your choice do you want to choose that way well that's life but life ends in death right or do you want to choose uh, eternal growth eternal learning okay so in a in a choice in a world with uh 
eternal learning, uh, learning forever here and now, we have this, um, like we're, we're greatly uh, motivated by the fact that, uh, you know, life is not fair. I guess that's the concrete way to say it, you know, even if you don't want to refer to God, but life is not fair. And so we need to make it fair or more fair or etc. We need to be co-creators with God. So, um, and if life is not fair, well, you know, what does it say about God, right? It says that, you know, things are set up so that we could grow. You know, if everything was right and everything was fair, then there's not really any reason or motivation to grow, right? It's just simply, it's kind of like a, but see, uh, the fact that life is not fair, it's a real issue that we we should grow, we can grow, and we we do grow if we choose to grow, right? So we have this choice, like which side are we on? Are we on the side of eternal life or are we on the side of life? So there's actually this choice. You see, like, are you going to choose life? Are you going to choose that, oh, God is good, and that means that you're not going to grow? <laughs> That's your choice, and you're going to die. Or are you going to choose to say, hey, you know, God doesn't have to be good. Life is not fair. There's a lot going on. I need to be good, and I need to fill the gap. Okay? So that was what I'm trying to say. Let's look at some technical issues about that. And first of all, uh, the kind of definition I was giving with that uh, schema there, and that's a very important schema. Um, but um, it was not defining, you know, what life, eternal life. It was just kind of giving a picture, saying I'm talking around these things. I didn't define any of them. But I just kind of gave their relationship, right? So it was a way of defining things in terms of themselves. That's maybe not the usual dictionary way of defining things, you know, because the dictionary way of defining things would be like, I want a line that tells me what it is and what is not, right? I want a line. See, the definition of the dictionary, though, first of all, like, you know, of course, you need a whole language already to be drawing such lines, right? We don't have that language. The second thing is that, you can draw those lines and those distinctions, but that doesn't tell you what something is. I think I told you quite a bit, like, what are these things? I didn't draw any lines, but I think you can get a sense through those relationships, like, hmm, are you familiar? Uh, and so Kirby Erner, you know, he is a student of uh, Wittgenstein. He reminded us the other day about games, let's say, as a way of, def uh, you know, so I said, yeah, that's a way to define things. But so you can see this kind of gamesmanship in the way that I'm operating saying that, well, what are the basic games? So you can look at that thing that I just explained and say, that's a basic game. Now, however, um, it is a fair question. Like, well, how does that definition of life uh, relate to biological life, right? And so just wanted to pull this out. This is, and this is one of the examples of those 24-fold sciences. So, uh, and so there's a whole family of them, uh, which is, has to do, I call them houses of knowledge, but like for any discipline. So you've, maybe seen this for mathematics, uh, this is for biology, take any discipline, and discipline is basically defined by the observer, so there'll be a, you know, if you look at the biology, like, what's the observer in this biology, right, what does it mean to kind of like being, uh, seeing, you know, what's biology, and so I have to think about what it means by that, but, um, and so uh, the middle one right here, there's 24 ways of figuring things out in biology, but this middle one is the key one. Transform environment by inserting a life form. You know, so you, you're in Australia, you put in a rabbit or something, right? And what, how does that change everything, right? That's a way to figure things out, okay? It has been done, things like that. You know, where you have a coronavirus and you put it in a population, right? <laughs> What's going to happen? It's experiment. So... Um, I think a natural experiment. But um, so that's the key one. Now, what's the observer there? Is it the life form or is it the person who does the transforming, right? I forget which it is. So I'll skip that. <laughs> I won't answer that. But that's the one that kind of like says that what this is all about. And um, and uh, so what, what this does and see what this, uh, what's studying, one of the consequences um, side effects, let's say, of this uh, study of biology is, you know, this is a study of not biology itself, but how do biologists figure things out? Like go through hundreds of experiments and organize them, categorize them. There should be 24 ways. You know, you should, this pattern keeps repeating in different sciences. But the idea is that uh, 
that can reveal, you know, how by what what the presumptions of biology are. What are the presumptions of these biologists? And so lurking in there is possibly a definition of life that would relate to what they're doing. And so um, the bottom part's not systemic. It's how you, it's pre-systemic, you could say, like what you need to have a system. But the top part is once you have a system, how it works. And when you add it all up, um, this becomes a system for managing traits for success. So living things uh, have traits for success, and they have a system of managing that. That's what makes them an organism. Right? So that's a broad definition. Uh, but you can look at the life form and say, yeah, it's a system uh, that manages traits for success. It has different aptitudes, and they all have to be coordinated. Okay, and they're, they're for different situations. Uh, does a brick have a you know a system for managing traits for success? Uh, probably not. You know, like not in a. Does a cloud? I don't know. Maybe you know, clouds may have bacteria. Maybe they're doing something together. So it's an open question, right? Um, but um, so, and then just to say, well, so how does this definition of life, uh, which I like, uh, relate to the other definition, which was much more um, pure and simple and uh, vague? Well, the key to that definition was this distinction between this holistic, loving God and then this uh, spiritful, free goodness, you know, that's kind of can circulate and flow. Well, so goodness here would relate to success. You know, success means that you're able to keep flowing, right? Um, and you're able to manage that, right? Uh, well, the, the fact that it's a system means that it's holistic. So that this holistic system and this kind of uh, success that can kind of circulate and flow and continue, persist, right, survive, that they're somehow related uh, through this management of traits, right? So that means uh, God is good. But um, let's continue now on um, this uh, equation. Uh, life is the fact that God is good. Eternal life is understanding God does not have to be good. And I just want to relate it to this uh, framework by uh, Stephen Toulman in The Uses of Argument is a book from 1958. Uh, very great um, example of practical philosophy, okay? And so this is the model of argument. This is how, and so this model is very helpful. I changed the wording a bit uh, just to make it more, I think his wording would be like, you can go from a fact to conclusions and the warrant is what takes you from the fact to the conclusions and the warrant has a backing, let's say. But let me explain what this is. But the idea is that, you know, A implies B. So A is the grounds, B is the consequence, okay? Uh, now, how does A imply B? There's some kind of C. There's some kind of, um, you know, reasoning that takes you from, that says, okay, well, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's cloudy and windy uh, and dark. It's going to rain, okay? So the... Um, so the grounds are this, you know, cloudiness, windiness, darkness, and the consequence are the rain, right? And what's the connection? The connection is uh, some kind of, uh, you know, prediction, right? Um, but what's the basis for that prediction? That's the justification. That's what uh, he would call the backing, right? So... And so, uh, you know, the, the prediction might be a little bit more, uh, you know, might just say like, you know, there's an 80% chance of rain, right, based on the data. You know, we have these situations, 80% chance. But the justification is saying that um, uh, this is with regard to the discipline of weather forecasting, right? That weather forecasts, you know, use this model. And so what that means that there's a language of weather forecasting. So they might not, you know, they may say 80% chance of rain, but well, okay, so what do they mean by that? Or, or they just may say, like, rain is very likely, you know, so very likely is a term that would, you know, they would define, say, well, that's so defining that term would be part of the justification, right? Or um, defining, like, well, what does it mean to be, you know, cloudy and windy and dark, right? Like, what are the boundaries for that? How do you do the measurements? Like, who's doing the measurements for that? Like, that's all part of the justification. Is that correctly done? 
the implication is just going through that, you know, calculation to say, well, we did the calculation, but now justification would be saying, but what is the context? And, you know, so that we, that would allow us to say that's really valid, right? The point being that um, in a court of law, you would have a different justification. It'd be a different domain and context. So the court of law, they'd say, that's a, you know, is it a matter um, beyond, a, you know, proved beyond a reasonable doubt, right? But for different things, there's weaker, um, you know, and in criminal and civil courts, there's weaker um, justifications. And so there could be subclasses, uh, or there's just basically a science. But in mathematics, uh, you have a different uh, standard for justification. Uh, in war, right, uh, in legal uh, issues, uh, in um, cooking, right, in art. So it's beautiful uh, formula because it just says like in every uh, domain, you have your own um, way of applying the rules. But the way of applying the rules is the same in all the domains. Just the details are going to be, you know, specific to the particular domain. It's a lovely thing. So it's very nice that actually this is uh, matches up with that. It's just a separate observation. So the idea is that the God is the grounds and good is the consequence. And what's the implication? It, the implication is that uh, God is good and that's life. Life is the fact that God is good, right? So life is kind of like the evidence, you know, the thing that kind of says, hey, God is good. You know, you got life around, right? Like that's, uh, that's just a wonderful, miraculous, uh, undeniably, you know, precious thing. Right. Just. But the justification of that fact that God is good is saying, hey, in order to make that implication. Right. Like uh, so. And, you know, here the domain is like this cosmic domain of like uh, just stepping out of this whole world and saying, look. To do that rightly, you have to step out of this world. You can't be a party in this world uh, completely and really understand what's going on, you know. You have to kind of realize, like, God is beyond this world. You're talking about God, right? Like, let's get straight, like, what is God, right? You can't be just stuck in this world and telling people, like, what is God? Because um, it maybe in that sense, God and good aren't even distinct. So then what are you talking about, right? If you want your thing to be meaningful from this point of view, you have to kind of step out and say, and were you able to be a person to step out of this world and live in parallel? And if... If you're the person who has been a friend to Brother David Ellison Bay, then yes, you have stepped out of this world and you have lived in a broader world, you know. So that's, this is my story, this is my song, you know, this is my testimony. So the technical uh, places this leads, right, is um, all summarized in this table, okay? So I gave the spirit of that equation, but it trans it transcends that. Maybe this is part of that going beyond, you know, um, in actually going beyond into the world, okay? Because that equation kind of makes sense, stepped out of the world. Uh, that's a spiritual equation. So I've written out uh, four columns. In the bottom, you'll see uh, God, good, life, which is God equals good, and eternal life, which is God does not equal good, okay? I'll just point it out with my arrows here. That's the spirit. And the question is like, well, what is spirit, right? So that's even hard to say. But the lack of spirit, you know, spirit removes itself, kind of like God removes uh, God's self when uh, God is uh, um, when God is uh, investigating whether, you know, what happens if God is not, right? So that gives you structure, okay? So when God removes God's self, uh, that leaves everything. That's how everything's created, right? So he just gives us all everything. And then, um, but everything is now structured. It's not spirit, okay? Um, the structure of goodness is slack, looseness. I had a friend uh, in Chicago, uh, Steve Bonzek. Uh, he attended seminary, but he was also studying uh, medicine. Uh, and then he um, was into Kung Fu. And so we did, uh, uh, we got together one day and uh, wrote down uh, the principles of Kung Fu. It's very good. There were eight principles, something about being centered. But the 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 coolest thing I remember from him was he said, slack is good. Okay, that's what he knows. It's like you gotta keep, you know, you gotta keep that um uh, things flowing, I guess. I don't do kung fu, but but um I turned it around though. I said uh, 
uh, good is slack, but more accurately, like the structure of good is slack. So good is the spirit of slack. The structure of good is slack. This, yeah, slack is the structure of good. Good is the spirit of slack. So then life is what combines those two, what we've been saying. And so the structure of life is anything in the sense that anything is everything plus slack. So the way I think about this, and you know, partly these are like mechanical, this whole table I put together a little bit mechanically, just kind of drawing together these, noticing these levels. You know, this takes years and decades to kind of piece together. And then something seems to hold together. And it's not like I understand it all completely, but I think, um, but you, you follow along and see how much you like this. So anything is everything plus slack in the sense that um, it's almost like, taking a nexus, like Christopher Alexander, the architect, uh, he studied uh, what makes a building alive, you know, and so he wrote these books about a pattern language, uh, and also the timeless way of building. And so uh, these pattern, like, you know, one of the things about living things, he has like the nature of order, you know, so 15 properties of um, principles of life. So one of them is the strong center, right? And so uh, this idea that, well, anything kind of like has a center, a nexus or whatever. So what's happening at that center nexus is like everything kind of like has an extra little slack where it could, from that one vantage point, it can be all, you know, relatable. Okay. So anything are these different little vantage points, maybe, you know, that slack makes possible and everything makes possible together when you have them together. You get these possibilities for different vantage points where they all tie together, right? So that's the structure of life in the heart of it, right? And that's actually very nice. It's a very trimmed down. You know, there's not much to it. Now, does a brick have that? Um, a brick itself probably doesn't have that in some sense. But if you think of a brick as a, um, I mean, if it's a loved brick, right? <laughs> If you love that brick enough, if somebody loves that brick so much, maybe that brick saved their life or whatever it is, you know, maybe that brick was, I mean, we make up long stories, but basically like, then that brick is tapping into a whole bunch of things in the universe where it actually has that little bit of lifeness. I was saying in a, in a previous uh, video, I think about like a puppy, like if you love that puppy enough, you know, and you can step in and step out and step in and step out, uh, alternating with the puppy, you know, then I believe, I think this happens, you know, that the the puppy uh, can get its hemispheres, you know, or it's like, uh, you know, answer mind, it's question mind, it's uh, pre-conscious mind, it's conscious mind. It can get them aligned, you see, and then it can uh, exhibit consciousness in a flickering kind of way. Right, like, then it just goes back to being a puppy. <laughs> but so, if you really love that puppy, right? I think that. Uh, but and so with a baby, it, it it sticks a little bit more. I think you know. So babies, you do the same thing, but uh, it uh, they're more wired for that. That's my pet. That's <laughs> a pun, I guess, but my little pet uh, philosophy on that. But so these are little. <laughs> it's completely not really relevant for the big picture, but. I guess maybe that's what people want in the den. So, okay, what is wisdom? So wisdom is being able to separate these things out and say, hey, everything and slack are two different things, okay? Don't confuse them, right? And so that's all structural level. You're basically getting the same equation. Now, conceptions, and I've called them in the past representations, I'm kind of abandoning that term because it's too mathematical. You know, we're doing math for wisdom, so we don't want to confuse ourselves. But there's like four conceptions of um, everything. And they're like everything, you know, wishes for nothing is self-sufficient, wishes for something is certain, wishes for anything is calm, wishes for everything is loving, right? And slack has two um, conceptions, which would be increasing slack and decreasing slack, okay? Like, so you, uh, you know, if you have like a shoelace that's loose and you draw a picture of it, it doesn't, does it look loose? It doesn't look loose, you know, <laughs> it's got to be moving, Right. It could be either be tightening or it could be loosening, right? English has this funny uh, thing about uh, loosen and unloosen are opposites, but they mean the same thing. Do they really mean the same thing? But certainly very close. Okay, loosen and unloosen is very strange. But that's just to get in the spirit of this. 
Now, if you put those four wishes and two identities together, I think you get six choices. Uh, parts of this are a little bit tentative, you know, but I'm just so happy and used to this that, uh, you know, what the point is with, we have to keep exploring this further uh, and, you know, checking it and you know, improving it or whatever. So the choices are, uh, there's four choices, like uh, you can choose yes, uh, no, not yes, not no. Um, but also you could be uh, choose to choose or choose to not choose. Okay. And so that's if you add them together, if you add the four and the two. But, um, and, and, and these are like, uh, conceptions are like, you know, it's a perspective on a perspective. You know, you're kind of standing back. What does this look like from the side, right? Like, what does everything look like from the side? Well, you have to kind of see everything in this process of God going beyond himself. And how far did God go beyond into himself? And is he outside or is he entering, you know, or is he leaving himself, you know, leaving or entering or in there, right? Like, so it's all dynamic. And so if when you're out there, you can see the dynamism all like, whereas God wouldn't see that, you know, God would say, well, there's God and then there's I, and then there's you and there's other, and it keeps going deeper. So God doesn't have those uh, conceptions in the way that we would if we stood out. So um, in the life vantage point, the four plus two equals six. Okay. And so, um, but in the wisdom vantage point, they multiply. You know, you keep them separate. So four times two is eight. And those are the directions of goodwill. And we'll talk about that uh, later separately. And so then when you unify these, okay, so those four wishes were um, uh, the self-sufficient, uh, uh, certain, calm, loving. And when you unify them all, uh, love is the unity of all of those. Okay. So uh, God is love. That's in the letter of uh, uh, Apostle John. Well, we can say technically what that means. You know, I can say it. this is how I would say: it. say, love is the unity of the conceptions of the structure of God. Okay. So, and in a certain sense, like love is God is a very important thing because it's saying like take God, and then just question like is god necessary and then go through the whole in investigation like you know sorting out like well what would that mean and then at the end of it it's love and so love in a certain sense is richer than god uh in the sense that it includes uh this whole manifestation of god even when god was not there you know where was god right so love kind of pulls it all together because love is the unity of all these wishes these wishes were these different stages ways of thinking of you know what everything could mean and everything was the environment you got when you God stepped away, you know, to have an investigation of God. Now, for goodness, uh, you have the increasing slack and the decreasing slack. So the unity would be, and I think of those as identities. Um, and I guess kind of like this thinking, you know, and this always needs to be rethought, you know, especially because I learn, I grow. And, and now all the more I hope we'll be working together, you know, with other people. But uh, the two identities are uh, very relevant in terms of imagining Jesus because uh, metaphysically, uh, you know, or the godling, if you would like to say, you know, there's this tiny little God that emerged, you know, when God pulled away, right? Emerged in, and we're the humblest vessel, let's say, where God could emerge. So that happened through us um, this, in, in this type of thinking. So this godling is bridging uh, two different uh, things like uh, that uh, godling is equal to god but also this godling is equal to us right so on the one hand the godling has to be perfect right because god is perfect but on the other hand uh, the godling has to be um, identical to us you know because so that we could all be one so the upshot is that these conceptions, I think of them as identities. Uh, and then, you know, when you pull it all together, it is perfection, but actually defines perfection, you know, so it's not just a, a cheap perfection. It's the real perfect, you know, it's the, it's the it's like perfection. Now, then there's an interesting thing that, you know, gives this all meaning uh, that, uh, okay, the six choices, if you unify that, that would be the human will. But the eight directions of goodwill and, um, Seven of them are kind of human, but the eighth is the good heart. So like goodwill opens up the way for the good heart. 
goodwill is like opening up channels in all directions, the good heart just kind of leaps out, you know. So if you see the good heart in an old lady or a child or, you know, some stranger or wherever it is, you know, you see God. That's the way to see God, right? That's one of the ways you see, oh, and that's in the good heart. See, so but that's God's will, like this kind of leaping out, right? Now, um, the human will loves the perfect, right? So that's a, the human will pulls together all those choices for what purpose? Okay, to love the perfect. But God's will is greater than the human will. This is like at the Mount Olive, right? Like So God's will loves the imperfect. See, God, Jesus says, hey, let's all good kids get together, you know, and show them what we can do. And God says, no, no, not about loving the good kid, about loving the bad kid. <laughs> you have to give up your life. You have to be the son of man. You have to be made an example out of. Okay. So all the bad kids are going to say, oh, no, look at what we did. You know, oh, but he's the savior. Oh, save us, save us. They didn't want to get together and say, hey, like, you know, of course, you know, for sinners, big deal. Like, but let's work together, do something good. No, no, no. No, you got to be saved. You know? like, so, okay, be saved. Let's all be saved. You know, I'm a sinner too. But that's not my choice. Like Peter, you know, that was not what his choice. He would have died for Jesus. You know he would have. Yeah. So, okay, so this is the table. I like it. So that last sentiment you know that the human will loves the perfect but god's will loves the imperfect you see that's not something i thought of that's what the table said you know so you work on this work on this work on this you know for years and you get something like that that's very precious you see that was what this is all about you know to be able to get some kind of like you know message back from the math you know from the math for wisdom you know from the table right that's what it's about. You know, can we be pushed to grow? So that makes me grow, I think. Okay. So let's look at this. Uh, column. Okay. So I call it, uh, what do I call these things? And, you know, I think these things in Lithuanian. So and I got to translate English. So it's an opportunity to kind of like, you know, rethink this. I, I've i thought of this table as the equation of life. And the other one I thought of like the equation of perspective. But I think really like, you know, what are better names for it? Let's call the other one uh, the equation of life. And it turns, you know, but under see, we call it equation of life because life is saying God equals good. Eternal life is not an equation. <laughs> you know, it's a it's a distinction, right? That they're not equal, right? Uh so one, but that's what the nature of understanding. Understanding means like to separate out. Like if you can understand, you can separate something out, you can understand how to pull it out, right? How to distinguish it out. So why don't we call that one um to go back here? Equation of life, understanding of eternal life. And this one called equation of will, because that's the top layer. That's where it all comes together. And understanding of God's will. So what I want to do now is I want to go through um, these um, four columns just to show in more detail uh, what am I talking about. And then that'll be um, possible to... Um, keep in mind, you know, in future investigations. Thank you for watching this video. I'll continue further with more details in the future video. Please like, subscribe, support me through Patreon. Peace.